We, be we begin this conference with a discussion about how the Sharia law has impacted women in Britain. And to, to do this, we have among us today El Hamania to discuss the findings from her book, Women and the Sharia Law, the Impact of Legal Pluralism in the UK. El Hamania is a writer, an activist, and an associate professor at the Political Science Institute of the University of Zurich. She has pub published several uh, academic and non-academic books, including The Arab State and Women's Rights, The Trap of Authoritarian Governance. She's also a consultant for, uh, for Swiss governments, uh, government agencies, and international human rights organizations. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome El Hamania. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the invitation and being here with you. And um, this is for me uh, an opportunity uh, to present my book um, as uh, described by Rayhana. Now, if you look at the structure, it's the, the book is uh, Women and Sharia on the Impact of Legal Pluralism in the UK. And it will be published on the 30th uh, of May. Um, as you see, the price is very affordable. So, um, if you see in uh, Amazon.com a different price, go to Amazon UK. They didn't change uh, the price as is right now the case. When it comes to the structure, it's the essentialist paradigm and legal pluralism. Um, the reason why I wrote this book has to do with the discussion that took place in Switzerland, academic uh, uh, discussion, um, about the possibility of introducing Islamic law in a uh, Swiss legal framework. And given the fact that I come, I just came back uh, at, the, at that time uh, from my field work in different Arab states, including Syria, Kuwait, and Yemen. And I was, how should I put it? I was uh, um, confronted with the reality of legal pluralism and the effect of religious family laws on women's lives there. And then I come to Switzerland and I hear an argument that seeks to introduce um, the very laws that seem to infringe on women's uh, human rights. Um, so from this perspective, I started to research and I realized uh, we're talking actually about a paradigm, a paradigm of thinking, a discourse, and I call it the essentialist paradigm. And at the same time, I divided it into different, the book into uh, different struct, um, um, uh, component, an argument, in fact, it's an intellectual argument why legal tourism is not an answer to Muslim authorities' <coughs> protection, and the first has to do with legal pluralism in practice, Islamic law and human rights, and I'm using Britain as a showcase as everybody seems to be using Britain as a good example in this respect, and Islamism and Islamic law in the West, because there's a political dimension to this issue, but then the context of women's reality. If you look at the argument, the main argument, that I'm trying to present to you today is this. We must look at the context of legal pluralism and its actual practice. It's not a theoretical discussion that we can um, um, pursue in academic circles. No. Um, we must also consider the consequences of introducing special, special laws for specific groups. It is the consequences that matter from my point of view. So if I will start, I will not bother you a lot with the essentialist paradigm. It just basically I will give you a quick um, definition. It's um, a paradigm of thinking that has become characteristic of Western academic uh, post-colonial, post-modern discourse. And the very much the, this discussion about legal pluralism um, produced also by this paradigm of thinking um, has four features. I'll put it this way. 
It combines multiculturalism as a political process with the policy of legal pluralism. You have to read the book. <laughs> Perceives rights from a group perspective. The group has the rights, not the individuals within. Dominated by a cultural relativist approach to rights, and you have the weak and the strong um, uh, cultural relativist approach, but it permeates this perception. And finally, it's hunted by a white man's group. Uh, you will see there's a whole chapter that is um, um, talking about these features and it's written, it's, it's not a book that is meant for closed conferences. It's meant for all of us. So, uh, and when it comes to definition of legal pluralism, I think it's very important just to, to talk uh, quickly about that. It's just, um, I'm using the Jack Van den Linden um, Definition, it's the existence within a particular society of different legal mechanisms applied to identical institutions. You see in different historical periods, specifically when it comes to the Ottoman Empire, you have the millet system where different uh, religious groups had different religious family laws. They have different laws. And um, in Middle Eastern contexts, uh, you see the heritage or the, the legacy of the Ottoman Empire in this um, uh, legal pluralistic uh, context. And you see this also legal pluralistic context in different countries today in the world, um, including uh, Canada and uh, the United States, specifically when it comes to the Native Americans. Legal pluralism has currently started to attract attention in Europe and North Africa, and this has to do mainly with the fact that we have, um, I'm, I'm part of that movement, you have a, a, a migration movement uh, with different groups, with different um, uh, religious uh, um, uh, backgrounds, and the, the, the result is basically um, a question how to balance equality and defense. So I go to the main question, why legal pluralism is not an answer to Muslim minorities' protection. I have to say something here. It's like when it comes to the essentialist paradigm, it's not that they, are, um, they would like to violate human rights. Their intention is actually good. Their intention is to protect. They would like to protect minorities' rights. And they think this is one way of doing it. In that, we introduce different laws for different groups. Uh, my argument, and I said the book is an intellectual argument against that, is basically, I don't think that's the right way to protect minorities' rights. Why? Because you have to look at different aspects. The first aspect, legal pluralism in practice. And again here, if you look at the type of, uh, if you look at the type of uh, um, realities in different countries, you will see that the consequences uh, often um, goes in two directions. One political and one has to do with minority and women's rights. So we start with this. Um, legal pluralism in practice, as I said, this, um, I was alerted to the consequences of such argument when I was in Switzerland due to the fact that I was working for this book. You know, and in that, for, for the research of that book, I was in different countries looking at different kind of uh, legal pluralistic um, uh, situations. You look at legal pluralism and you see here it has a political function. If I look to Middle Eastern countries, okay, I see um, a political function that intersects with divided society in the post-colonial era. And it exists when the state fails to treat its citizens who are divided along religious, sectarian, or tribal lines 
as equal before the law. In fact, it reflects a deficiency. And if you look closer, you see that the family laws that have been used, they made sure the system of legal pluralism of family laws were discriminating against women, does discriminate against women, regardless of which religious family we're talking about. But it is also the tool that has helped perpetuate the very social division of Arab society. It has kept society divided, hindering intermarriage between Sunnis and Shia, Christians and Muslims, Jews, superior tribes, inferior tribes. And in the process, in each country, it has sabotaged national unity, uh, uh, national identity, and nation, uh, nation uh, building. Now, this sounds a little bit abstract. Look closer, you see um, two features. Stratified citizenry. Look at Pakistan. Look at Saudi Arabia. And also look at Israel. And you will see that there, as we're talking about a pyramid, and in that pyramid, it's very clear who is in power, who is holding the power. So the ethnic group that holds power often stands at the top of the pyramid. Those, let's look at the Ahmadi position, for instance, in Pakistan. The Ahmadiyya uh, minority. Um, look in Iran to the situation of also Sunni and Baha'i. And you see a certain kind of, it's le the, the legal structure um, reflect um, a stratified kind of citizenry and it tells you exactly who is at the top of this citizenry ladder. And then you have the second part, and it has to do with the double discrimination syndrome. And here we see the uh, the gender <coughs> dimension to this whole discussion. Here we see women who are trapped between their um, aspiration for equal <coughs> treatment and gender justice, and then on the other hand, um, these aspirations as citizens and the needs of their ethnic religious community seem to collide, um, and which often feel specifically these communities, whether I talk about ethnic or religious community, they feel that their very existence is threatened within the state and hence demand ultimate loyalty from their members. And you're sandwiched between two here. <coughs> the second part relates, um, I, I talked about the Jirja system, I talked about different kind of like um, uh, legal pluralistic uh, realities in that chapter where I just focused on that uh, dimension. But there's also another dimension It has to do with what type of law are we trying to introduce? It would be good if we ask that question. So, Because the issue, as I said, it has to do with consequences. It's not that I have a position against a certain religion. I come from this religion. And here, I have a definition of uh, Sharia. I define it by the way it's being implemented in Islamic states and within Muslim family laws. And that means I'm not looking at a potential uh, uh, justice uh, in uh, this, these Islamic uh, Jewish Buddhists uh, uh, for the future. In fact, it's basically, I look at it as it is being implemented, and that means it's a selection from the corpus of legal opinions of jurists developed over the course of Islamic history, especially between the 7th and 10th centuries. It's very important. Remember, when was that developed? And it was developed in a different historical period. It was de developed in a, in a period where you have um, different perception to women's role in society. 
And this reflects, of course, on the type of jurisprudence that we have. And I'm just, I just put the, the four uh, sources of uh, um, Islamic law, the Quran, the Sunnah, that the, the saying of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, Ijma, that is the consensus of the uh, jurisprudence on one um, specific legal opinion, for instance, um, the fact that uh, a Muslim woman cannot marry from a non-Muslim man comes from this um, consensus. Um, and it has, again, a political function. And then ishtihad is the use of the rationality. You could also replace it with qiyas. But in any case, these are the four sources. And it hides, it highlights by, by defining it as it's being implemented, it highlights its problematic nature because we are not considering here its theoretical potential to provide justice. What matters is how it's being interpreted and used today, not how it could be used in a century from now. What matters is its obvious limitations and how it contravenes modern concepts of human rights. That's what matters. The consequences. It has to do with the consequences. <coughs> now, I will give you a very quick um, introduction into Islamic, um, um, into the status of women under Islamic law. And um, one has to basically look at it from two perspectives. On the one hand, uh, women have full legal capacity under Sharia in relation to civil and commercial law matters. That means what? This is like when I get married, um, my name is Ilham Mana, or Mania, and uh, as everybody calls it now. <laughs> and um, when I married my husband, his name is Thomas Knech, I remained Ilham Mana. Uh, I didn't lose my identity because my civil identity as an individual uh, when I got married to him. Okay? At the same time, whatever I have in my position um, from property remains in my, um, uh, I still own it. So from this perspective, a woman is an individual. <coughs> and please notice that I always try to use writings of Arab and um, uh, of scholars of Arab or uh, Islamic heritage, <laughs> just to show that we have a very vibrant discourse when it comes to this issue. And just Abdullah Naim also said that yes, we have this, but at the same time, Muslim women do not enjoy human rights on an equal footing with Muslim men under Sharia. And it's very important to mention that. How? You see, these two levels within the Quran itself, the verses. So on the one hand, you see one level that tells you man and woman are equal before God, and it seems it pertains to um, the judgment and the treatment after life. But in this life, man and woman are not equal before the law, specifically when it comes to family laws in family structures. And that you can see in different, in this dif in different uh, also verses in the Quran. So you have two levels. And um, accordingly, men and women are not equal in front of the law according to these verses or to Sharia provisions. So I'll give you several examples here. First, when it comes to the marriage, uh, the male guardianship is very necessary in, in order to contract a marriage. So what that means, um, for male ward, the guardianship ceases when the boy reaches puberty. Now when it comes to a female ward, 
the guardian has a power to impose a marriage on a virgin girl without her knowledge or consent. You know, and um, if you think that this is an exaggeration, I would appreciate it. if you look at different family laws in different countries and see how these this is implemented in reality. In Kuwait, for instance, where I also studied there, uh, research there, it's a, sometimes uh, uh, a young woman would discover that she got married um, because her father, who was estranged with her mother, decided to marry her off in order to spite her mother. The law does not require her presence. He has the legal capacity to marry her off. You have, of course, uh, one important exception that's in the Hanafi school or the Shia school, of Shia school. Okay. And specifically here, when it comes to the Hanafi school, it gave uh, uh, the, uh, the, this jurist, um, he said, if a woman can contract uh, a contract, if she has this um, financial capacity that I talked about before, if she can have her own property, she can also contract a marriage. But she has to have um, uh, to reach uh, age of puberty, and it wasn't clear when, but it seems to be 15 according to Abu Hanifa. Now the interesting part, he connected it, because again, it comes within a context of its historical um, and uh, 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 social structures. Uh, Abu Hanifa con connected it with this kafa'a principle of uh, the right of the guardian uh, to annul and cancel a marriage of his daughter or his ward if he deemed this groom to be unequal to his status. Okay? Pay attention to this because it's important. It's not theoretical here. Okay? For a marriage, contract involving a non-virgin female to be legally sound, the consent of the bride and the guardian is needed. Both of them has to sign to it. Okay? There are other legal rules. Um, we can talk about it later, but anyway, most importantly, again, is that you see that the guardian has a very important role in this um, system. In addition to that, Muslim man may be married up to four wives at the same time, but a Muslim woman can only be married to one man at a time. And in addition to that, a Muslim man may marry a Christian or a Jewish woman, but a Muslim woman may not marry a Christian or a Jewish man unless he converts. Now, when it comes to divorce, A Muslim man may divorce his wife or any of his wives by unilateral repudiation, talaq, three words, talaq, 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 and without having to give any reasons or to justify his decision. It's uh, really unilateral. That is a right. He has this right. That's why you don't see many men going to the Sharia councils. A woman, on the other hand, you will see she can obtain a divorce by three means. First, she can, like in the Jewish uh, 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 law, by means of um, um, the consent of her husband. If he said yes, we have no problem. And then after that, if he, say no, if he says no, then you have to prove harm. And if, you, and, um, if he insists on not um, uh, if you cannot prove harm, usually you have to give up your financial rights. Uh, it's called an uh, Islamic law khula. And here you don't have to have, you don't need the consent of the husband. That's not practice here that way. But anyway, a waiting period of three months has to lapse in order for a woman to marry again. A divorce in which the word is uttered fewer than three times is revocable. During this three months, the man, the husband, can bring his wife again to him against her will. She thinks, I'm divorced. During this three months, he can simply say, you can come back. And in that respect, 
there's not, um, he will need not sign another marriage contract. And when a husband divorces his wife three times, the divorce is considered um, final in order for her to go back to him. She has to marry a new husband and divorce him in order to go back to him. Okay? So I realize that sometimes when I discuss with some colleagues um, uh, not working with Islamic law or friends or people who are discussing this issue, journalists, there is this perception, why do you have a problem? That the question is basically, why do you have a problem? It's just like you're getting a blessing, a religious blessing for this marriage. And my answer is not that only. I married also a religious marriage before I got my civil marriage. But I married a civil marriage in order to protect my rights, because I knew what type of law we have. We're talking about a legal dimension of a religion. We're not talking about a religious lesson. It's very important to distinguish here. Now, at the same time, um, maintenance and custody of children. You look at the maintenance you have here. Wait, I'm sorry. Uh, after three months, uh, she doesn't get maintenance until, uh, unless she has children, of course. And most importantly, after divorce, the wife is only entitled to the sum of money set in the marriage contract, the muakhar. According to the Swiss law, where uh, right now is applicable to me, in case I divorce my husband, we're, we're, we're married, we're together since two years, so I hope that not, will not happen. <laughs> but then anyway, according to the, to, 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 the, to the Swiss family law, which changed in 1988, before it was really not a good family law, according to this family law today, if I get a divorce, whatever we both um, acquired during this 22 years, we would divide 50-50. Uh, we work together, even if I didn't work. 50-50. But according to this, if you're not clever, if you didn't ask your husband to put things in your name, you will come out with the sum set in your marriage contract, in the muakhar. And with all due respect, when I got married, I was so in love with him. And then my, my brother, so my husband didn't have a clue, he's Swiss, okay? And my brother was the one who was making the contract, and he said, what do you want in your, and um, as a, a sum of money, I said, come down, come down. I was so much in love, but I also married a civil marriage. So I was in love, but I had also a brain. <laughs> Custody of children, here you see a different dimension as well. Custody of children is entrusted to either the mother or father, depending on the child's age and sex. But younger children tend to be placed in the mother's care, and the father takes over custody when the child reaches a certain age. Okay? And that said, it's very important to distinguish between custody and guardianship, because the guardianship remains with the man, regardless. And you have certain stories, really, when, when, when you realize, in, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, um, um, the mother, or Kuwait, that, that was told to me by, by Khawla uh, Matar. A woman, um, hold on, uh, 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 it's not important, someone else. Um, she basically, um, um, an activist in Kuwait, divorced of her husband, she has the custody of her her son, she has to go with him in an emergency to the hospital. They wouldn't let him in within the, uh, without the approval is of his father. And his father was away. He was traveling away. And from this perspective, it sees that it ha uh, the distinction matters a lot. And most importantly, if a woman decides uh, to ma remarry, she automatically loses the uh, custody of her children. 
And when it comes to obedience, um, it's considered a duty of the wife. A wife should be obedient to her husband insofar as his commands are re legally allowed and are ordained as duties of marriage. If a wife is disobedient, she loses her right to maintenance. And um, disobedient, that means that she leaves their home without the consent of her husband or without a lawful cause. Okay. It could be also disobedient that she would work against his will. And at the same time, if she refuses sexual intercourse. Uh, in this case, there are measures of discipline, uh, disciplinary measures, um, and a husband may beat his wife if she is disobedient. He can resort to several measures when his wife disobeys him, the last of which is the most severe, beating her. If the woman obeys uh, him, then she should stop using these measures. Now the problem is, it's just like, I'm sorry that I bombarded you with these kind of like, uh, um, uh, provisions. The problem is, this is not theoretical when we talk. It's not theoretical. <clears throat> Sharia provisions are not theoretical when it comes to the lives of women of Muslim heritage. And it's very important when I'm saying that that I'm talking here about classical jurisprudence, okay? A classical jurisprudence. And it changes the way you apply these laws from uh, one country to another. Some countries are trying to modernize. So the further you go away from the Arabian Peninsula, for instance, the, uh, uh, the more progressive the family law will become. And when I say progressive, it means that these countries are trying to modernize these family laws, stay away or get further away from the most restrictive or religious uh, basis and move to a civil law. And let me give you a comparison here between two countries, Tunisia and Yemen. Tunisia had a civil law. And it's a civil law where they say, we are using the concept of ishtihad, but with this ishtihad, we could basically come up with something that respects gender equality. And it's a civil law. So you see here, when it comes to Yemen, so 1992, a guardian, a guardian is uh, required for the marriage to be contracted. The guardian is respectively the, the woman's father, son brothers, their sons, uncles, the sons, uncles of the fathers, their sons. When, when, when one dies, the other comes, main thing, he's relative, he's male, okay? Here, marriage shall only be contracted with the consent of both future spouses. Unilateral repudiation of the wife by the husband, when it comes to Yemeni family law. Wife has the right to ask for a divorce if she proves that her husband has harmed her or if she gives up her financial rights or pay him for a divorce. And his consent is necessary for this khula. According to juris, classical jurisprudence, you don't need the, the man's or the husband's consent, but according to this reading, it tells you, yes, you need it. That's what's happening here as well. If you look at the other side, divorce shall be carried out only before a court of law. Forget about this. <coughs> You go to a civil court, and both of you apply for divorce. We're talking about two Muslim countries, you know? And I don't think Tunisia are less uh, uh, connected um, to their tradition. You have many. Of course, it's a very diverse society. But that said, they didn't have a problem with modernizing this legal aspect and going in the direction of uh, civil law. Look at the obedience. In a Yemeni context, wife owes her husband obedience, especially in the following four cases. 
He chooses the place of residence. We had that in the family law in Switzerland in 19, until 1988. She fulfills his sexual desires. She follows his orders and undertakes her domestic chores. And she is not to leave her mar marital residence without his permission. That's by law. It's in the law. Now you go on the other direction. And here, again, it's a little bit ambiguous. Each of these spouses shall be considerate, maintain good relations, and avoid causing injury to the other. And both spouses shall fulfill their conjugal duties in conformity with customs. What that means seems to be interpreted according to the context. So today, with a certain re-Islamization taking place, it goes in a different direction. But this Tunisian family law for prohibits polygamy. Because in the same verse that talks about polygamy, it allows men also to have slaves. So should we take slaves? So from this perspective, they see this is something related to a certain context. So what about the UK? What type are we implementing here? What type of Islamic law is being used as a framework and implemented within Britain's Sharia courts? The short answer, the classical Islamic law, Yemen. Yemen. And it's taken out of, you have what I call an anthropological uh, version uh, of law that is being taken out of context and being implemented here as if it's that's God's word. Sharia is not God's word. Let's put it this way. These are legal provisions that can be changed according to our time. Now let's, I'll give you some examples about the minimum age of marriage. According to the mindset seems to be um, prevalent in many um, uh, Sharia councils here. And I am I'm, I'm using um, a quote from the, the president of the Muslim Arbitration Tribunal, because I think it's very problematic that under the arbitration law of 1996 that one can implement um, uh, Islamic law in family affairs. And that said, um, please what he's saying here, um, I was trying to see what is the mindset, what is the reference that he's being used, that he's using, okay? When it comes to minimum age of marriage, according to Islamic law, the, the classical one, there is no minimum marriage, uh, minimum age of marriage. And that means when uh, a girl reaches puberty, uh, then she's eligible to be married. You can contract a marriage according to a very rigid interpretation at any time. Um, but uh, the consummation of that marriage has to do with the puberty and the decision of the guardian um, whether the girl is fit to be married or not. And we have that in Yemeni Islamic law where basically the, the father can decide if she is fit to have sexual intercourse, that's the wording of that um, uh, article in the family law. When I asked him what he thinks about the minimum age of marriage, uh, in my view, puberty is the right age. But puberty is the minimum age. Then the next criteria is the decision of the guardian. He has to make the decision. Because in some societies, 12 or 13 year old women, um, girls, they are more or less fully fledged women. They are fully functional. And you in Western societies are having babies. They are having sex, so they are fully grown and fully mature. There are some 12 year olds that are not in that condition. They are very weak. They are not fully functional as women, and they don't want to get married. So it is the job of the wali, that's the guardian, to ensure that the girl is protected and the girl is not subjected to a marriage in this situation where her personal circumstances don't allow this marriage to take place. Okay. 
about the Guardian. Um, I have to say here, um, in my, uh, uh, I did several interviews with several sheikhs um, um, who are arbitrating and or arbitrating. That's what they're doing, and, and they're um, in these uh, um, councils or tribunals. And some of them are really trying very hard to be on the side of the woman, okay? And here in this case, uh, one, one example, well, this uh, Dr. Muhammad uh, uh, Shahut Khafran, who's from Syria, uh, of the Muslim Welfare House, he demands that the bride and the groom and the guardian be present at the wedding ceremony, and he said, with this, you can stop the ability of uh, forced match. He wants to make sure that there is no forced match, okay? But to contract the marriage, the guardian has to approve. For him, this is something absolute. You cannot basically play with it. A woman in her 30s wanted to marry. That's an example that he gave me. And he said, where is your guardian? The guardian is, it, uh, is outside of the country. And he said, well, I have to contact your guardian. He called him, and he asked him, do you approve? And if you approve, can you delegate this power of your guardianship to another male so he can contract this marriage in her place? And then I asked him, don't you think she's adult enough uh, to contract that marriage? And the way he answered it was basically a matter of fact. Uh, the guardian is present. The guardian is present. So if he's present, you cannot basically uh, get over this. And when it comes to the kafa, remember when I said, keep attention to that aspect? The Hanafi jurisprudence allows the guardian to cancel a marriage if he deems um, the groom unfit socially or religiously. It's how we define kafa uh, uh, differs according to which country and which jurisprudence. <coughs> now, and the people I interviewed considered this provision valid. It has been used and applied in the Islamic Sharia Council region and in the Birmingham Islamic Sharia Council of the Central Mosque. And the thing is, it's very arbitrary. Why? Because depending on your position, if you would like to be on the side of the woman, you will find loopholes. Okay? So in Birmingham, he was trying very much to be on the side of the woman. There, it wasn't. And that's, that brings the, the core issue that we're talking about. You bring in an arbitrary system. An arbitrary system in a legal system that actually guarantees equal treatment. It's not that, let me just put it here. The treatment in Sharia courts depends depends on the type of Sharia court applying this law. It can either seek a fundamentalist interpretation of fiqh, or it can try to make the lives of women easier by seeking the most lenient interpretation. But that said, the mindset framed by the perception that Sharia is God's law, and I said it's not God's law, this is like, with all due respect, um, these are legal dimension of a religion, just like all religions. And I, when I see the family law in Switzerland, how it was shaped by uh, religious uh, perception before 1988, and how that changed, we see a process. And this is also should also happen uh, uh, in different religions, including Islamic religion. <coughs> shaped by the acceptance of the rules that regulate marriage, divorce, polygamy, guardianship, inheritance, Anything related to family affairs and women's positions within the family, there is no, you don't question it. That's the perception there. You don't question it. And judges reflected in interviews that their perception that this is what Islam commands. This is what God commands. And we are following God's law.
I'm going right now to the third dimension. So the first dimension, you have, in fact, um, if, I, if I come to summarize what I said before, I said, first of all, look at the reality of legal pluralism in different contexts, and you will see that they actually lead to a situation, specifically when it comes to women's rights, um, uh, where these women are being uh, treated differently, discriminated against. It has political function, um, and it can lead to um, discrimination against minorities. And the second one, what type of law? And that law, with all due respect, discriminate against women, and it discriminate against women with impunity. Of course, you have loopholes. Of course, the way you interpret these provisions uh, may be left to the judge. But that said, it's the corpus. It's a corpus that was developed between the 7th and the 8th century. And then there is a political dimension to the issue when we talk about here. And that's the role of Islamism, Gesundheit. Now, when it comes to Islamism and Islamic law in the West, what I'm trying to say here, there remains the problem. Ah, that's not my words, I'm sorry. That's Dr. Hassan, Osama Hassan. He said that in his submission regarding Baron Cox's um, uh, um, arbitration and mediation services. Quality bill, and he wrote it for the Quillian uh, Foundation. And he uh, said in his um, response, there remain the problem of extremist clerks sitting on UK Sharia councils and publishing extremist fatwas that make life difficult for Muslim, for, for women, especially uh, uh, women. And he say Muslims because it's not only. Uh, women, you have also LGBT poor, uh, groups uh, who also can suffer from this, and you have young uh, children and boys who also can suffer from this. When it comes to uh, type of Islamism, mm -hmm. I distinguish between two types. It's very important to, to look at it from this perspective, and these two types can also have ramification. The first one, what I call societal Islamism, you can call them uh, new fundamentalism, as uh, uh, Olivia Roy uh, does. And it is it refers to these puritanical religious movements which concern themselves with changing social behaviors that confirm to their rigid worldviews, call for an Islamic mood of life, separate its followers from its wider society. It tries more or less to separate you from your surrounding uh, with an argument that you really have to follow strict kind of guidance. And some of these, uh, the movements that uh, I mean under this banner of society or fundamentalist uh, Islamism are movements that are usually modern Islamist movements, modern religious. Um, uh, interpretation, and they were um, developed in the 18th centuries. Uh, one Salafi uh, Islam in the Arabian Peninsula in the 18th century, the other in the South Asian context, the Yubandi Islam, which is very widespread here, also developed in the 18th century. The second one is the <coughs> political Islamism. It's a political ideology. Of course, it's shaped by a fundamentalist interpretation to Islam. And it's very important to, to uh, I teach about Islamism. And uh, when you look at the literature, when you look at the biographies of all of these um, who developed the two, uh, the two, um, the Salafi Islam, and then um, Yubandi Islam, and then you look at the biography of those within this category, you realize that they were uh, influenced by, by these movements. And I mean with that, Hassan al-Banna, Sayyid Qut, Abu al-Ala al-Mawdudi. It's an ideology, a modern ideology that seeks states' political power as a means of changing and transforming existing societies. 
Power is only a means to an end, and its goal is a revolutionary change compelled by a vision of a puritanical society and state. What brings them together, societal Islamism lacks a systematic political ideology not concerned with state building. Political Islamism calls for political participation, but while he's doing that, he insists on a separate communal group Islamic identity. That's very important to mention here. What brings them together, in addition to ideology and interpretation, the two types, are their goals. And the goals are basically a society that is governed by God's law, not man, woman's made law. It's called hakimiya. A state where identity and citizenship are based and defined by religious affili affiliation and observance. And that's very problematic. Imagine a society. Just change religious affiliation with race and color. And that would become clear what we're talking about here. A state trial by chosen supreme group of Muslims in both literature of the two types, the word you are supreme by your um, observance is very much part of the world view. Concept of military and missionary jihad, depending on the strategy, depending on the time, depending on the context, you might go for missionary jihad or military jihad. But of course, you have this division into two camps, we and them, um, believers and non-believers. And most importantly, they share a common feature. When they start, they start with women. When they start, they start with control of her behavior and body in their preacher of an ideal Islamist world. So you have a political dimension. You cannot disregard it. There is a political dimension that we tend to ignore. Those Muslims in the West who call for the introduction of legal pluralism and the use of Islamic law are often, often, not always, affiliated with either forms of Islamism, societal, or and political Islamism. So the issue is not only about conservative clerks and imams who are using the law in ways they have always known about. The issue is most significantly also political. And I will just go quickly, because I see right now with the time, says I have 11 minutes. Um, you have the connection. What is the connection between Sharia councils and between um, Islamism? Look at the membership of these Sharia councils. Members of the two types of Islamism, society and political, often control British Sharia councils. Uh, so you have Maududi, Jama'a Islamiyya. You have Diwandi, Ahl al-Hadith, Salafi. Jama'at uh, al and you have, of course, in addition to that, um, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, uh, the one that I mentioned before, that doctor from Syrian uh, background, he is working in an um, organization that is well known, affiliated with uh, Muslim Brotherhood. The second part is ideology. Those working in the Sharia councils often display the ideological and political features of Islamism. That's, uh, you just have to read, to listen. Read what they're writing, listen to their sermons. And you just have to see with whom are they affiliated and you see these features uh, coming to the fore. And third, co-optation. Islamists have co-opted the idea of weak legal pluralism to suit their own political agenda. So you have a discourse, an intellectual discourse of the essentialists, and they are more or less coming to the fore and saying we would like to have this respect for minority rights in the name of uh, freedom of religion. With all due respect, freedom of religion is absolute, the manifestation of which, the manifestation of this religious of freedom can be restricted. So 
So please don't forget that that's I'm talking about, like, uh, according to international human law. You know, that when it comes to the respect of freedom of religion. So framing the use of these Sharia concepts as obligatory and religious necessity, presenting a decontextualized patriarchal interpretation of Islamic law as a standard that should be used here. And as I said, freedom of religion, I am a Muslim myself, I practice my religion. I don't want anybody to infringe on that right on me. But that said, on the other hand, if that right means that I'm going to violate the rights of children, of women, of homosexual, LGBT groups, then with all due respect, the state has a right as well to interfere and stop that. When it comes to gender consequences, if you have extremists, more or less, in many of these Sharia cons, I'm saying in many because you have some, for instance, Osama Hassan, Dr. Osama Hassan, who's the son of Sheikh Soheib Hassan. The Osama Hassan is trying to help women. So please, as a, you see some people who are trying to help because of a situation, and I will explain afterwards when I'm talking about the gender dimension, because they see that women are more or less are stuck in a situation, impossible situation, that we have created here in England and the, U and the UK, and we seem unable to solve it. If you have extremists um, uh, controlling uh, many of these uh, Sharia councils, this Islamist fundamentalist ideological feature affects the way they look at certain issues in terms of resistance to reform, specifically in relation to gender um, uh, dimensions. And you have here an attitude of a literalist adherence to the strict restrictive parochial worldview of women and insistence on their treatment as minors. And again, I'm using Dr. Osama Hassan. These extremist clerks would say a woman can never marry on her own accord. She can never divorce on her own accord. She can never have equal inheritance with men, let alone more than men. And they are all basing this on a literalist interpretation of the Quran, which is one characteristic of fundamentalism, in my understanding. I'm going to the fourth um, dimension, and I will not, I will conclude with it without giving a conclusion because the recommendation I would like basically to present when we talk together here uh, uh, in the afternoon. When it comes, <coughs> you would like to implement very often. Um, when it comes to this uh, intellectual discourse about introducing uh, Islamic law within Western legal systems, you have the argument, well actually it's an argument where it, uh, it looks at the person as um, an independent person. You have a choice. You have an ability to exit. So you have a kind of like, it's like you are going in a supermarket. You like to buy yogurts, and you have different types of yogurts. You choose whichever you want, okay? It's a privatized concept to justice right now. They're telling us, now you go into a supermarket, and you have the state's law, but if you choose, you could go and choose different types of laws. But you are an independent person. You can choose. My argument is always, you would like to choose, very beautiful. but Please look at the context where we are talking from. And I, I've been to, as I said, Yemen, Syria, Kuwait. I've been to South Africa. I've been here. And I've been in other countries because of my travels, because of my work. And I've seen women's reality. And it's not as straightforward as one tells me. You have a choice. Yes, I have a choice. So, but what context are we talking? And I'm not talking about a woman like me like you, educated, you have ability, 
basically to understand, hey, we have, we have certain loopholes. I know exactly what I'm going to put in that contract. I'm talking about a context where the least privileged, the least privileged, will be discriminated against. That's the, that's the most problem. You leave them vulnerable. And in my opinion, the state has a duty to protect here. So from this perspective, you look here, look at the gender-based violence that seems to be predominant in certain uh, contexts, especially in the context we would like to introduce um, uh, Islamic law in. Women in the UK with South Asian roots are more likely to live in poverty, to be unemployed, to be in poor health, and to inflict self-harm and attempt suicide compared to their female counterparts of other ethnicities. These are the outcome, this is the outcome of many um, studies, reports conducted by many of the women organizations that I see representative of here. Okay. Poverty and employment, economic inactivity compound, is compounded often with the type of gender-based violence and it's a gender-based violence that has also, uh, that is being shaped by certain cultural perception. So you see here, rigidly defined matrimonial roles, duty of women to maintain the family aizat or honor, bearers of community and family honor, you can bring sharam or shame on their families and the extended kin. And you have a social control that borders on locking out girls and women. A social control. And violence and physical abuse towards young women unfortunately continue to be community sanctioned method of controlling their independence. And these are the words of reports conducted by Muslim organization, Muslim women organization. So when we talk about this exit option that we seem to like to use very much in our conference um, uh, meetings, when we talk about the possibility we could uh, bring in this possible, this um, measure of conflict resolution, in my opinion, it's within, in such a context, it doesn't really make sense. It is within this context of patriarchal structures, social control, and the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, because that's very important. That's very important. It, will, it has certain consequences, and I will explain afterwards, that women of Muslim heritage are expected to exercise their choice. A choice that is so constrained by such structures, values, and norms may not be a choice after all. And with all due respect, I repeat again, I'm not talking here. It is the most vulnerable women who will fall victim to the introduction of Islamic law in a Western society, not the articulate middle class woman. And that said, despite their agency, every woman has agency. Despite that, they are often left to a system that will certainly exploit their vulnerability. I said um, um, it's very important the uh, aspect about Islamic fundamentalism because you have an Islamic fundamentalism that tells you you have to implement Islamic law in every aspect of your life and this is a worldview of Islamism. It also insists on you that you have to implement Sharia in the way you resolve your um, uh, complex, including family law. And the way the interpretation of this um, uh, fundamentalist interpretation goes in the direction where it's the most um, <coughs> It violates dignity and rights of women with impunity. Okay? But that said, also the problem is, and due to many factors, and please read the book, you will see that there you have 
Among these decades, in the last decades, a mainstreaming of Islamism, of the, of the main worldview of Islamism, seems to be permeating today. It's like much of the discourses that we see within closed Muslim uh, communities. And it reflects also on their perception. So you have many women who are, who are divorced according to the civil law, and they are told that's not a divorce. You have to have a Sharia divorce. And interestingly, in many Islamic countries, a civil divorce is a religious divorce. You don't need a religious divorce. So look from here, I thought it would be also interesting for, to you to talk about the profiles of women turning to Sharia councils. You have the first type, which is about a woman who basically would like to have a religious divorce because she believes that a civil divorce does not suffice. And it has to do with this lack of information, uh, specifically when it comes to mainstream or fundamentalist uh, reading of Islam, but that would come also later. Or, anyway, that's one way. Within this category, you see um, another subgroup. Here, you see a, a subgroup of second and third uh, generation of Muslims. Um, South Asian um, um, uh, British citizens or migrants who, I think, British citizens, who are basically born and brought up in England and often have a strong Muslim identity. They would like to have a religious divorce. And within it also, you have the new uh, converts to Islam who basically take up a religious mantle. And just as they want to have a religious marriage, they would like to have a religious divorce. The second. Uh, profile, the second type is the women who were married outside of the UK and these marriages may be either forced or arranged. The thing is basically again the lack of information. Um, no civil marriage followed in the UK. Now according to uh, uh, international private law and according to British law, these marriages are valid they are legally accepted. They're legally possible, and it's possible to uh, dissolve it by a civil court. But they don't know that. The women don't know that. So they end up in a Sharia court. And with this, cat this category, you see women who are basically who come to England on a spousal visa. This is the, the category that I was talking about. Often marrying a cousin or a member of a clan living in the UK. They don't speak English. Have little of any or any formal education. And unaware of their legal rights in England. And that said, they live under the patriarchal regime in the family household, often in poverty in a ghettoized area of England. And women in this category generally believe that the community is the only option they have in England. Okay. And then you have the third category. This is the third type where you have they marry in the UK, but a religious marriage, and they fail to register. Um, their marriage, and such marriages called nikah are not recognized under civil law, so these women must go to Sharia court to get a divorce. And the thing is basically here, you have several reasons why women don't register their marriages. On the one hand, you have one reason is basically ignorant, ignorance about the legal status of religious marriage. Some really believe the moment I have the religious marriage, that means I'm automatically registered civilly. And they end up with a bad surprise when they get a divorce. Okay? You have another category of young women who would like to experiment. They would like to know this person really also sexually before they commit to a real marriage. Okay? And you have also 
husband who makes a deliberate attempt to trick his wife out of registering a civil marriage. And here, he, he, on the one hand, um, there is an attempt to deprive her from the rights that civil law affords to women, and I've seen that also in South Africa, by the way, in the Diwandimu um, uh, community in uh, Johannesburg. And another reason, he's entering into a polygamous marriage. Now, this is a big problem. One common feature between these women, what they often want is a divorce. That's why they're going there. It's not that they want to have arbitration, mediation. What they want, I would like to have a divorce. I wouldn't have come to you if I didn't try everything else. But that is complicated by lack of awareness of their legal rights and status of their type of marriages and mainstreaming of the fundamentalist interpretation of Islam which propagate the false assumption within close UK communities that a Muslim woman is only divorced through an Islamic divorce. And I'm coming right now to the last statement in this presentation and then I leave the conclusion uh, the recommendation to, to, to the afternoon, basically, often women are not seeking religious arbitration. What they need is a procedural measure that allows them to get a divorce without having to go to a religious divorce. And instead, we come up with an argument, you have to introduce Islamic law to respect minority rights with all due respect. You could, you could, there are very difficult measures that has to be taken, but within um, British law, it is possible to solve the problems of these women without creating a parallel legal system. Because again, and I repeat it again and again, it's the consequences that matter. The consequences. Thank you very much for your is going to transform the paradigm of the conversation on women's rights in the UK, especially for Muslim women, as well as for Orthodox Jewish women and women from every other minority communities who are in very, very difficult situations right now. So now we will have a uh, question time for the next 20, for the next 30 minutes. We will be taking questions till uh, 10 past more, and after which we'll be going for lunch. And uh, if um, I would request uh, anyone who wants to ask questions to queue up either from, uh, from the middle of the room. So, uh, so anyone who asks a question first, you can just uh, answer that. That's OK with, with the volunteers as well? Thank you very much, Elham. It was uh, brilliant. I started reading the book. I recommend everybody read it, not just once, but a couple of times, because I think it is going to be, as Rehan has said, something that's going to hopefully really make the British government listen. It's got all the evidence and all the arguments there so clearly. And I think what's great is it's got everything in, in one place, you know, in this book. So if you want to know why, here, read this. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you um, something about what the British government says, because we have written a letter to the government. Uh, you know, we've got the speakers here from British Muslims for Secular Democracy, South Law Black Sisters, Centre for Secular Space, uh, Ipro, One Law for All. Uh, we've been corresponding with the government, and uh, one of the things they say is that 
this is not a parallel legal system. Don't call it a parallel legal system. British uh, law, English and Welsh law is supreme. Uh, it, you know, people are going for mediation. This is not a parallel legal system. So what would your arguments be about this in particular? Because I think that's one of the things, one of the hurdles we need to get across. Thank you very much for asking this question because, uh, yes, uh, it seems there is a certain kind of a denial um, uh, on the side uh, of many, um, including uh, this response that you just uh, um, uh, described uh, previously. Um, it's interesting to, to listen to such an argument, no, they're just uh, resorting to mediation, um, because if you are in the House of Lords, if you are in uh, uh, 10 Downing Street, you may not look at the reality as it is being um, lived in close communities. Because you actually have close communities. And within these close communities, um, and, and I know there was a huge response about this survey, uh, about what, what Muslims uh, really think. And with all due respect, uh, I think uh, this survey wasn't any different from any other surveys that shows also constantly there is a certain reality of separation. And with this certain reality of separation, you also have another parallel legal system that tells women this is the way to do it. And you have to go through it. And within these legal structures, you have this mindset that I talked you have this legal corpus, and you can't tell me that this is not parallel to a system that tells you you are equal before the law. I know the implementation is always difficult, and it depends on your gender, on your class. I know that. But, but why, why complicate the issue further and add to it an arbitrary uh, uh, legal system? So from this perspective, it's a denial on the side of the government. And I do hope that they change their mind and they conduct their own research um, by, um, in a manner that looks at the reality. And they listen also to the voices from within these communities. Because it's incredible uh, what uh, many women and men are trying to change within these communities. And they say, enough is enough. Enough is enough. Yes. Um, my name is Jocelyn Scutton. I'm originally from Australia. And what I can affirm to you is that in Australia, both sides of politics have said no to Sharia law very, very clearly. And mm -hmm. let's hope that they retain that position. But I wanted to say one thing about the arbitration and ask a question. On the arbitration, it clearly is a parallel system because when women who are non-Muslim go to arbitration, the principles that are affected in the British arbitration system are not the principles that are being affected in the Sharia arbitration system. And therefore, it's clearly a parallel system. If what was being affected through the Sharia courts was the British family law, then it would not be a parallel system. But it's completely different principles that are being affected, and therefore it's parallel. And it seemed to me that that's the categorical answer that really needs to be given. But my question is this. In this country, ecclesiastical law did rule family law, and that was where the origin of family law. And there was a struggle between the ecclesiastical courts and the secular courts, and eventually the secular courts won. And it was the last bastion, the ecclesiastical courts with the family. Therefore, do you think that one of the arguments that could be employed here to say no to Sharia law is that the same development has gone on in the British legal system of the escape of women from the ruling group in the ecclesiastical courts 
into the secular courts. Now, we would never say the secular courts treat women in this country equally in reality, but at least there is a recognition that there needs to be equal treatment and equal recognition of women's rights, for example, through family law. So would that be one argument that you yes, can employ? Yes, yes. And I'm sad, so I feel, thank you very much for, for mentioning that. Because, in fact, that's why I mentioned the family law of Switzerland. It was changed in 1988. And look at the provision before 1988. I couldn't work without the permission of my husband. I couldn't uh, issue a passport without the permission of my husband. And he can move to another canton and I have to follow him according to the family law before 1988. And these were shaped by religious <coughs> interpretation, broad views. And that's what I'm saying. That's why I say this. I'm not criticizing a religion. I'm talking about the legal dimension of this religion. And this is, has to move in a direction that respects the, the, the norms of gender equality and human rights as we understand it today. today. And from this perspective, yes, that's a very good argument, in fact. That's why I try always to say, remember how it was before, and I say that to my students, and don't tell me that because if you don't know your history, it would be easy, very easy, uh, to forget that others are struggling in the same struggles that your mothers and grandmothers were fighting for. And you have, and that is also mentioned in the book, where you see, where I mention the struggles that are taking place in different uh, uh, countries of uh, Muslim majority uh, population, what they're trying to do how they're trying to move forward. And there, the direction, despite the onslaught of fundamentalism and Islamization that took place because of the Islamist uh, um, uh, strength, uh, you see a direction where they, they are basically saying, let's go away from this um, uh, classical interpretation of Islam that I just presented to you. For instance, in Morocco, right now, they're pushing for change in terms of inheritance law. And you know, according to Islam jurisprudence, it's always half-half. <coughs> My brother and I, is, when we inherit, uh, we would have, uh, I would have half of what he has. But in Morocco, they're saying no. And they're trying uh, to change it. And here, we're going backwards. It's like, uh, let's not modernize. No, 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 no. Let's bring this classical Islamic Law, the context, it's like an anthropological version of uh, um, uh, Islamic law, and let's implement it because we would like to respect the minority's rights. Whose rights are we trying to respect here? It's certainly not the woman. And with all due respect, men are not monsters. You know? And, and from this perspective, it's uh, this version of Islamic law, the one that I showed you, that is in, in Yemen, it doesn't reflect social realities that we have uh, in different countries. So, questions? Yes, that's, uh, I think it's a very important, uh, I think schools have a very important role in um, mainstreaming the values and norms of equality and citizenship according to a perception of the human rights that we have, it's like uh, enshrined in, in laws. Uh, the question is basically how are you going to do that in faith schools? And that's a problem. And um, from my perspective, I believe state schools, they have 
a very important role in terms of showing and um, how to say it? it's like basically instilling these values in every child of this country, regardless of religion. But at the same time, showing as well that not only you have rights, but you have also possibility to um, uh, access these rights. Um, if there's a, an attempt to marry you off, there is a possibility to, um, to say no, that you have the right to say no and that you can say no. But that's the thing. And, then, and that's it. While, while I'm talking about education, I talked about the Islamist uh, dimension, the political dimension. And I, I'm talking about it because I see the whole thing as a big puzzle. But you have to put all the pieces together in order to see a picture here in front of you. Now, if you have 50% of the mosques, uh, according to a certain report, controlled by two movements, the Diubandi movements and Jamaat al -Tabi. And both of them are fundamentalist interpretation of Islam. And the Ubandi Islam, please don't forget, produced Taliban. So don't forget that. Now for me, freedom of religion is absolute. How do you express it is another issue. And that means the state has an ability to restrict the madrasas that you have attached to these mosques. And I know many will basically look at other ways of just Don't talk about that. But with all your respect, it's a responsibility. If you are, you, you think you have the right um, to look how the kindergarten are teaching your children, then you also have the right to say, religion is no excuse of instilling a certain kind of radical interpretation that has consequences because it's not any um, type of uh, message we're talking about here. It's a message that tells you it's like you have to separate yourself and you have to hate and wala wa bara. In your heart, you have to de associate yourself from others who are considered polytheists. I've heard the word kuf. Um, uh, unbelievers here in a way that I that reminded me of the time that I spent in Yemen in the 80s. And there, at that time, the Islamists were up there really starting their full force. And I was surprised to go there and hear that word. Here, in the middle of UK. And this is mainstreaming of an Islamist fundamentalist uh, 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 teaching. And from this perspective, the education is very important in public schools, but while this is the case, there are also policy measures that we have to take um, in order to make sure that we are all part of a society that actually would like to live together, you know, not separate ourselves. the historical perspective here. Um, and this a question, uh, a comment and a question, I think, for discussion. Yes, the Obama Islam did produce the Taliban, but it was funded by US and Saudi and NATO money. Now, it's very important to, I think, confront the geopolitical dis dimensions of Islamism. I came to this country as a student in 1970. Why is it? that when I left Pakistan in 1970 to come to university in Britain, I had more economic rights. I was an equal citizen in Pakistan. I had same rights to evidence in Pakistan. I had the same rights as men, and those had now been eroded. Why is that? Why is it that when I got married in 1975, 
I did not confront the issues that women have to confront today. Why is it that there were no Sharia councils at that time? I think that these are important questions that we have to ask and we have to push our governments on this. That why is it that this is happening today? Why do we have faith schools today? Why when I was sending my children to school in uh, the 70s, I did not have the choice to send them to a Muslim school. school. Yes. Thank you. Now, thank you very much. I'm glad that um, this is a very important dimension that you mentioned. And uh, first of all, let me talk about geopolitica, and then I will talk about the context here. Yes, there is a geopolitical dimension. And I, I told you, I teach about Islamism. You know? And when I teach it, I teach it in different contexts. And one sees that basically, let me talk about my country of origin, Yemen. You see, for instance, um, you had north and south of Yemen. South of Yemen was communist. North of Yemen was allied with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was allied with the Soviet Union. Look at the context of uh, Saudi Arabia allied with US. Well, the United, uh, United States. What did I say? Soviet Union. Soviet Union. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking, anyway. <laughs> uh, Saudi Arabia was allied with the United States. So you look from this perspective and you see that during that time, within this context of the Cold War, one tool to confront um, the socialist ideology was using religion. And it wasn't only Islam. It was also capitalism. Please don't forget yeah, no. things. So um, Islam that was used was not any Islam. It was Wahhabi Islam. And it started at the end of 70s. And it's interesting to see that, for instance, that in the, until the mid 70s, you had in north of Yemen one hour of ethics one hour of ethics for students. The moment this started to change, and you have Abdel Majid Zindani, who is the mentor of Osama bin Laden, he became the minister of education. He then introduced eight hours weekly of Wahhabi Islam. Not any Islam. A fundamentalist interpretation of Islam. And that has been used. And it also has been also used in Pakistan, but with the Diobandi uh, movement, in cooperation with Saudi Arabia, with also, don't, uh, let's not forget what happened with uh, um, the al haq The president who, who had this military coup, and it was done <coughs> with the blessing, of course, of the United States when it comes to this. And with it, a change in a direction of Islamization. So this is the geopolitical dimension. Okay. Why I'm saying that, today, yes, we have this problem when it comes to, uh, sorry, I always like to do that. Um, um, why I'm saying that, so when, when I think about it, today, yes, you have geopolitical dimension. You have certain factors that plays to that. But now is the time that we say, I'm sorry, uh, we have to stand up to these fundamentalist movements. It's like, I'm not going to blame the United States all the time. It's just like the United States. And it's like, okay, thank you very much. You've done your job. And you are paying the price, unfortunately, like everybody else, including us. Everybody is paying the price. Uh, the whole world is paying the price. So we have to work together right now in order to fight this fundamentalism. When it comes to here, it was interesting, and I described it also in the book, certain factors that played to the situation that we see today. It has to do also with the colonial legacy, where basically, how did we use to treat or to, to deal with our colonies? And legal pluralism was part of it. You know? And then afterwards, you have certain kind of factors that relate also um, to, uh, on the one hand, um, Margaret Thatcher and her idea we have to roll back the state and let faith groups uh, enter the picture and privatize in a way uh, these um, service 
sciences, and then at the same time, the labor playing also a role. All of them played a role. The, uh, the labor uh, uh, party also very much keen on winning the Asian uh, vote dubbed lately as the Muslim vote, and that means concessions. And look at the other way. And this, this essentialist paradigm, and uh, with all due respect, a concept of multiculturalism that, that doesn't bring us all together, that we come from different backgrounds and we respect each other on equal footing. Now, it was a multiculturalism that led to separation with policies that, that led to, you, you have to stick your, to a, your identity in order to get your kind of funding as an organization. And, and these, these have consequences. And today we are left uh, with this situation. Uh, yes, I believe uh, I believe we are all responsible in a British society, and I'm talking about the, uh, uh, from a larger perspective uh, society here. Um, I'm not calling it tolerance; it's almost indifference. But it's it's a real. I see a genuine fear of insulting God. Uh, a genuine uh, attempt to understand the other and respect the other. But while this is the case in your, because there is a certain kind, uh, remember when I talked about several features of this paradigm, the essential is one of this white man's burden? It's, you're so haunted <laughs> by this guilt to an extent that you are unable to see the other separate from yourself and your guilt. And from this perspective, it's time that we look at each other across these boundaries, identity, religion, no. humans. I'm, as a human, expect from you the same that I expect from myself. And from this perspective, it's time that we insist there are rules of the games, but these rules of the games are enshrined in freedoms that we understand today, today um, uh, emanating from uh, human rights. Equal, equality. Um, but at the same time, respect the fact that, um, yes, you are different, you have a different tradition and culture, that doesn't mean that uh, that means it's okay to, to hit your wife or that you apply a certain family law that tells you um, uh, that she is uh, uh, a minor. Uh, so, uh, sometimes I get tired, honestly. Sometimes I really get tired by well-intentioned people, really well-intentioned, and I understand their, their motivation, I respect that motivation, but please, again, Context and consequences, and once you look together, there might be uh, a better approach to that uh, than treating people differently and applying different laws in society. Thank you so much, Mihal. Uh, I see you have that great job here. <coughs> You said uh, multiculturalism has played a role in dividing people and uh, playing negative roles in our societies. I agree with you. <clears throat> and also, you said uh, they want to, us to divide into different groups and give us identities. And they want us to call ourselves Muslims, Jewish, not, not as humans. I agree with you. But I, I want to, uh, it raised me, it uh, caused me to ask a personal question. 
just, uh, if you excuse me, I don't want to ask it. Yes, no problem. In your talks, you said, I call myself as a Muslim. Yes. I'm a proud of that. It, for me, it doesn't it contradict what, what, I'm you're saying. Doing, what you're saying. Yes. Why do you have to call yourself a Muslim, not a human being? Well, just, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> for the simple reason, because I'd like to emphasize that I'm talking from within. I'd like to emphasize. But I agree with you. It's a contradiction what I just said. But there's a book that I wrote, published in, uh, in German, in the German language. And there I talked about the different layers of my personality. Okay? And um, at the top of which, of course, being a human. So this is the, the output. Then comes being Arab. I'm not going to say Yemeni because uh, Yemeni, I've been, I was born in Egypt, I traveled in many Arab countries because it's just, I'm, I'm a big salad, confused. <laughs> you know? But I'm an Arab. The language, that's my mother. You know, the tradition, the music, food, that's me. Okay? That is part of me. Human, Arab, and then a choice. And that's, I, that I hope that my daughter also got it. Religion is a choice. It's not that because my parents, I had a father when I was 13, told me, can choose. Imagine, 13 years old. And he was telling me, you can choose being a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, or an atheist. And my mother was like, her. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And in the end, I decided to remain. There, is, there was a time when I was questioning myself to an extent when I basically, I don't want to do anything with this religion. But over time, I realized all religions went through this. You know, it's a choice. I choose to remain. And yes, it's a contradiction. I understand that the way I said it, it's a contradiction. But it's very important that this type of discussion that we understand is happening from within as well. As, and we, together, all of us, whether we, we, we would like to, be, uh, re, uh, to choose this religion or be out of it, ex-Muslim, women who live under Muslim laws doesn't really make any difference. We all have a stake here. Because it's, it doesn't only concern Muslims and non-Muslims. For God's sake, the whole issue is a society. How does a society function? And since when, since when um, applying different laws to different people has meant justice don't forget apartheid. You were part of a group, you had different kind of treatment. And it's interesting that the legal pluralism that right now that is being pushed by certain groups, even in South Africa, that was actually a legacy of apartheid. So from this perspective, I hope I answered the question. And. Uh, Again, I say it's our <coughs> responsibility. Just don't be indifferent. Don't tell me that uh, in the name of respect, I would basically look the other way around. Don't be indifferent. Thank you, Alhamdulillah.